point, especially when you are a drag queen. I think it's the ability to adapt. You have to adapt to the environment, you put the wig on, you show up and you go, this is it. Hello and welcome back to the second installment of my series, Decent Exposure. Today I'm getting up close and personal with the undeniable queen of tea, <laughs> the clown without a frown, Miss Bianca Del Rio. Clown without a frown? Without That's a, a frown. good one, I haven't used that one. I know, that I came up with that last night. There's so. a couple of them, there's like clown in a gown, the nasty yes. cunt. Those are usually the things people <laughs> use to describe me, myself actually, yeah. Um, how are you? I'm alive, I'm You're good. Alive. I'm in my last week of Jamie and then I yes. get back to America. Yeah, I mean, you're doing Jamie now for the second time. Correct. And I mean, it's been six years since you won RuPaul's Drag Race. Six years of uh, showing it, but it was seven years since we filmed it. Because ah. we filmed it in 2013. And then it, we filmed it in June and July of 2013 and it aired in America February of 2014. Oh, wow. So as of right now, it's like six, seven, seven, six years from Filming, because we're in February now. And from filming to airing, you didn't know who the winner was, that right? No, we didn't. Uh, actually, we, we don't know much, because uh, our particular season, we film the whole series within five and a half weeks. So we film everything back to back. So we do the challenges day to day, which people don't realize. Wow, yes. So we don't get a week in between. You film all of it, and we filmed up to the point of the top three. So there was me, Courtney Adore, and Darian, because it was four of us, and they chose top three. So they filmed each one of us being eliminated from top three. And then we left for many, many weeks. And then we came back in May of the next year to right. film the finale. So we didn't know who even top three was until it aired in May. And then we went in and filmed the finale, which we figured out the week before who the top three was. Ah. Then we filmed the finale. And as we filmed the finale is when they choose the winner. But we film oh. all three winning. Oh, wow. And then we really don't find out till it airs, which was two weeks later. Right. So that's why on the show, maybe when people win, they don't always seem quite as ecstatic or emotional. Well, I did because I knew the other two <laughs> didn't stand a chance. No, I'm kidding. So drag for you is obviously a huge part of your life. Yes. You started a very, 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 very long. <laughs> Long what time. a cunt. <laughs> yes, 19, 1996 I started. Wow. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember your first time in drag? Yes. Uh, the first, well, I had been in drag a couple of times because I was in theater uh, for many years and I'd done costumes and wigs and makeup for theater, so I've been involved in it many times. So the first professional gig I had, a friend of mine was uh, doing a gay wedding in New Orleans and they were filming, they were having the ceremony at Anne Rice, famous writer who does all the vampire movie, vampire books, uh, had this particular place where you could have weddings and events and parties and this gay wedding was happening there. They wanted drag queens to perform. My friend was hosting and she said, do you want to do this gig? And I'm like, uh, no, I'm not interested in being a drag queen. She goes, it's $500 for one number. And I was like, sign me up. <laughs> so I did the short shortest number there was, which is Shirley Bassey's Big Spender, which I think is two minutes and 36 seconds. Yeah. And I did that and that was it. And from there, one of the other girls said, do you want to come and do a guest spot at the gay bars? And I started doing a guest spot. I did it once a month. And then all of a sudden I was doing it every month. And then I started uh, filling in the week. So that was on a Wednesday night. And then by the end of it, I was doing shows five nights a week in a gay bar. Wow. For many years. Yeah. And at that time, were you already Bianca Del Rio? In the beginning, I wasn't because I'd done a show called Psycho Beach Party, uh, a play called Psycho Beach Party. And in the show, there's the bitch in the show and her name was Marvel Ann. And when I did these first gigs, I didn't have a name, so I just thought Marvel Ann would work. And then a friend of mine, Nikki Rich, who I loved dearly, was a drag queen in the show. She's like, that's not going to work. You have to come up with your own name. And she gave me Bianca Del Rio. And what was weird was she goes, you remind me a lot of my friend named Bianca. And I was like, oh, she's like, she's passed away. And I was like, oh, that's so <laughs> sweet. Now. Cut to the night that I win Drag Race and I get back to my hotel and I'm going through all my text messages and Nikki Rich, who I'd not seen in many years, sent me a text message and she goes, so proud of you, blah, blah, congratulations. She goes, by the way, Bianca's not dead <laughs> and she's furious. <laughs> and I was like, ah! Oh! So it was like 17 years or 18 years later that I find out that this bitch is not dead and we have the same name. Have you ever met her? I have not met her, no. Oh I feel bad. I mean, can you imagine the hate mail she gets? <laughs> it's like, ah! Oh! So Bianca is not dead. Hi, Bianca. <laughs> Maybe she's dead now. I don't know. It's been a couple of years. Also in your early days, um, yeah. I heard that you um, had a mean share impression in you. Oh, God, yeah. Well, 
you know, in the South, because I was from New Orleans, well, I'm from New Orleans, is that everybody had a gimmick. And right. a lot of it was illusion-esque thing. So when you're brown and have a big nose, everybody was Cher. <laughs> so I, I, I used to do the Cher number with a puppet, uh, with a sunny puppet. And I did it for many years. Actually, I still have the puppet. And uh, we used to have different outfits. And I used to do that. And then obviously you, you, you work up to turn back time and all these different looks. But that was just the thing that I did. It was the only thing I could get away with. Most queens do Cher and Barbra Streisand because right. of the nose thing. Of yeah. course. Yeah, so that was it. And, you know, it really wasn't my best thing. And actually, when I was in New Orleans performing, I was hosting a show. Uh, I can't remember the name of the show at this point, but it was an illusion show. And I was the host, and at the end, I would do share. And Lady Bunny had come to see it. This was probably 25 years ago. And Bunny had come to the show and saw it. And she says, Girl, you were really funny as the host. Uh, you shouldn't bother as share. You know her voice. But yeah. basically saying, you shouldn't bother with Cher. You're much funnier as a host. Find your own look. Other people are going to do Cher and do it better. But find what works for you and work on that. I thought it was great advice. And then cut to many years later in New York. We were doing a show together. And I said, you know, Bunny, you gave me some really good advice. And I tell her the story. And she looks at me lovingly. And she says, girl, I told you to die. And I'm like, you see, there it is. There it is. Misunderstanding. Now, of course, uh, we have to talk about RuPaul's Drag Race. Of course. Um... Now, you, it never ends. It never ends. The show <laughs> and the conversation. Um, so you went in in season six. So you Correct. had the luxury of watching five seasons. Luxury. But before you went in. Well, you know um, what's funny? I didn't. You didn't? I did not. I was not. This is going to sound horrible, but I was not a super fan of the show. So I only saw four and five because that was... That was like the marathon. This is when they started doing marathons and yes. you could see what was going on. I, w I couldn't tell you everything about the first three. Now I've gone back and seen them. Uh, but at the time, I wasn't all my friends. I'm also a horrible person because like everybody at the time that was all about Glee. I hated Glee because everyone liked it. <laughs> so I'm one of those people where I was like, mm, mm, I don't want to get into it. And then when I saw the show, four and five, because of Sharon and Jinx, those particular seasons, I loved it. And I thought, wow, this would be an amazing opportunity to get to do. So I didn't watch them consecutively each week and wasn't one of those right. people. Uh, but I did see marathons of it and I thought, wow, this is kind of great. Did you realize going into the show and when you applied just how much it would change things for Not you? Not at all. No, and I think that was the opportunity. I knew that there was a great platform. And I also, at the time, I think I was 37 when I went on the show and then I turned 38 while we were filming. I thought, okay, I'm ready to wrap up drag at 40. And I thought, this is just a chance. And I'd seen a lot of my other friends uh, or, or acquaintances from New York that went on the show mm -hmm. um, and did well and, and you know they were not that talented so I thought <laughs> why not take this opportunity go and see what it has to offer what do I have to lose and if I end dra drag at 40 it is what it is I didn't tell anybody I was auditioning because that's the big mistake everybody makes yes. everybody posts it oh I'm gonna audition well then you're fucked when you don't get on um, I did it all secretly and I thought well let me do this um, sent in my video and then it just kind of happened. And then we were there and I thought, what do you got to lose? You go in and you do it. And I did. And I remember the night before I left, which was on a Wednesday, because I was leaving on a Thursday to fly to Los Angeles because I was in New York. And on Facebook, Courtney Act, who we had been friends on social media, she sent me a message. She says, well, I see you tomorrow. And I said, where? <laughs> and that was that. So uh, it was one of those things where you go, you give away your phone, you have no contact with people for the next six weeks as you film, or five and a half weeks that we filmed. So it was a surreal experience, and all I kept thinking was, just get through it. You know, it's yeah. like sex with somebody ugly. You just gotta <laughs> get through it, and you don't know what the outcome's gonna be. So that is true, you're not allowed any contact with anyone on no. the outside. No, which to most people would be crazy. To me, as an adult, because I'm now 44, Four, that I'm like, it's a fucking treat not yeah. to have your phone. But the kids are like, I need to speak to someone. Yeah. I need to have contact with the outside world. And for me, it was great because I borrowed money to pay my rent. I was trapped in this situation that I enjoyed because I like, I like the experience and I like yes. being put on the spot. And I had nothing else to worry about. All I had to worry about was what was in front of me. Yes. Is there anything that you think, oh, I wish I'd known that before we got in, onto the show? Oh, everything. I mean, you, you, once it's done, it's done. And I think what... I, sadly, what I see happen to a lot of people that go on the show, even people that have been friends of mine that have gone on after, is that they pick apart the situation. The thing is, you put yourself in there. 
First of all, when you cast, you're not cast because you're the most spectacular drag queen in the world. It is a television show. So you're going on here, and of course, they're putting a room full of people into a space and saying, let's go ahead and have this pressure cooker boil and test people and make good entertainment. Mm. So even that, if you keep that in mind, if someone doesn't like you or they critique your outfit, it doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean you're a horrible yeah. person. It just means, okay, this group of people that you allow judge you doesn't like it. Yeah. This is what you get when you go into it. So I didn't think that they loved everything I did because uh, there was obviously a lot of people that were much prettier and were better vocalists and had better costumes and stuff. But in the end, that's not what it's about because it is a television show. Mm. So there's different elements and it's their decision. So what I've seen people do is when they leave the show, they complain, well, it was this and well, it was that. Girl, you took a chance and it didn't work out. Yeah. It's okay, you know? So um, many things I would have changed in the end, but when you're there, you have no choice. You know, you're kind of trapped and you have to make it work. Now, of course, you're known for uh, your sharp tongue, <laughs> your wit and your honesty, your yeah. Rolodex of hate. Which most people don't like. Yeah, <laughs> I love. Wait, it varies, it varies. I mean, because some people do take everything a little too, well, we live in a world now, especially with social media, that everybody has an opinion of what you do, which is fine. You know, you put yourself in this position and you and you go out and you have social media and people can say whatever they want. The thing I don't care about is that I refuse to have a phantom person or a 13 year old cunt tell me what I can yeah. and can't say. I mean, I'm a grown fucking man and if you don't like me or what I have to say, change the channel, don't buy a ticket, go live your fucking life. I don't care. Well, actually, that leads me on to one of my questions. Um, is there any topic for you as a comedian that you feel is off limits? No. No, and I think that's what it is, is that it, it is comedy, and whether it's your cup of tea or not, once you set boundaries and once you start apologizing for things, you backtrack. Look at the situation with Kathy Griffin, who had this whole Trump thing and put the head up, and then she was like, I'm standing by it, and then I'm backtrack, and then I'm this. It just gets flooded. This is what it is. Mm. This is my approach to it. This is my view. This is how I look at it. And it doesn't matter if you don't like it. I'm not your public official. I am not your president. I'm not your mother. I'm not your boyfriend. I don't have to answer to you. And you don't have to like it. It's not for everyone. But I think we live in a world with social media now that people lose themselves in it and feel like I have to be loved and I have to be liked yeah. and someone's upset. So you're upset. Great. I've also had, for, you know, for a person that can be upset about something online and I've had an audience of, you know, 1,500 people that laughed at it. What do you do? You know, do I sit there and apologize for myself? No, you don't like it. Move the fuck on. Yeah. I'm not asking you to be my friend or to have a connection. That's okay. But then the other problem is, well not the other problem, but the other reality is that everybody's a blogger, everybody's got a thing. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a headline, you know, and they have to print something. And I remember, I've said this story before, but I went to a party and uh, there was a guy there who was a blogger and came up to me, he's like, hi Bianca. I said, don't talk to me. I said, you don't even like me. He goes, oh honey, it's nothing personal. I just have to write stuff every day. Mm -hmm. And in my head I went, Oh yeah, it is a game. Yeah. So the same people that say, Bianca said this and we're offended and how dare she, blah, 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 are the same people that say, hey, would you be on the cover of our magazine? Of course. So it's, it's business and it's bullshit. So you either read it out or you live your life because I, I just can't. I can't be concerned with those types of things. Apparently it's not for you. Mm. And when people say, you're a role model, well, you're stupid. Don't, don't make me a role model. <laughs> I'm a gay man who does what I do and live my, don't put me on a pedestal. Cause once you put me on a pedestal, you're gonna try to take me down. That's just what it is. Um, I definitely feel from our day at DragCon together and speaking to a lot of the people who are in the queue for your meet and greet, they take a lot of your comedy as a form of therapy. Sometimes <laughs> life can be shit. It can yeah. be shit and you've just got to laugh about well, it. You completely have to laugh at it. And I'm the biggest joke there is. So you have to laugh at it and it's also just my perspective of something ridiculous. It's like, as I said before, I'm not your public official. I'm not elected to this high office mm. where I'm supposed to stand there and you're supposed to go, that's it. I mean, look at anybody in the gay community, as they say. Look at any person that has done anything good and how they've tried to break them apart. No matter what it is or what they've done, they, the gays in particular yeah. will love to break it down. And then you've yeah. got this group of children that live on the internet that feel meh, 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 and you go, so what? So what? Type all the fuck you want. It doesn't affect me on that level. Yeah. But they do try to, to break people down. And I, I feel it's important to laugh. I laugh at myself. I laugh because I'm this. Um, but not everybody's going to like mm. it. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Now, um, your quick wit 
Well, it depends on the day. Yeah. <laughs> depends on the day. Um, one of my uh, favourite videos I've seen of you online is in uh, the cafe in San Francisco. Oh, I thought you were going to say my OnlyFans. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've been joking about OnlyFans online. If someone's going to think I'm someone's really going to I am not. But it is funny how everybody has an OnlyFans now. Like, every fa like even friends of mine that I'm like, yeah. she's got an OnlyFans. Like, girl. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, the weird situation with that was it was prior to winning Drag Race and I, you know you were on this club circuit and you were doing it in the Castro I, I was it, it was it in no what was it called it was in the cafe the cafe, the cafe yeah. in San Francisco and I'd gone there and I want to say I could be wrong but I'm sure someone in the comments will tell me I think it was a viewing party of Drag Race right. so there was a host there and I came in as the special guest and we kind of did commentary during the commercials and we watched the episode and then after I think I did something with the audience and I did something with the audience and I usually do this game where I deal with Every, representation of everyone's there. So I always have like a Spanish contestant, an Asian contestant, a, you know, a white girl, and then I have a black girl or a black boy, whoever, whatever, just to have diversity and we have a good time and we make jokes and we do what we do. And that particular night, um, I was there and, and I did this whole thing and this guy in the audience, this Hispanic guy in the audience was not having it. And at that point I thought, well, come on bitch, what, what? What do you have to say? What's your story? The Latino community pays your bills, baby. You know what I wish? The Latino community would pay their own fucking bills. So all of this kind of unfolds. I know no one's filming it. Bitch, I've been telling you this. Two things happened just now. You think you're telling me a story, I know what the fuck I'm doing. I'm a man in a wig who's done this for 18 okay. years. Let me tell you this. Yes, I have a microphone now. And I know you have a microphone tomorrow when you run in that drive through What I want you to know. Your bullshit, I'll drive to your motherfucking window, queen. So don't come up here and place your order. We wrap it up, it's done. It's now like two o'clock in the morning. I leave there, I go to my hotel, get out of drag, pass out, fly to the next city. I think it was in Texas the next day. And I'm in Texas getting ready. Uh, for the next gig and I actually the first time I look at my social media and then this video is like everywhere and I'm like oh fuck and immediately I thought oh my god they're gonna they're not, I'm not gonna win drag race now because it's so scandalous and it was just one of these things where I thought this is fucking wild so it's my first taste of something happening within social media that I had no control over because I got on the plane so a matter of hours all of this yeah. went online and what was so silly which I once again, you don't explain yourself or defend yourself. But in the end, what made me laugh the most about it is that this guy was simply telling me that I can't make Hispanic jokes when I'm Hispanic. <laughs> yes. It's like, <laughs> you are fucking dumber than yeah. shit. Like, you don't know anything. And that's what, in the end, made me laugh. But I never felt the need to go and discuss it or go back and tell everybody, well, of I'm course. No, because that's stupid. Look, if you don't get it, you don't get it. Do your research and you'll figure it out. But it was my first taste of, oh, shit. And it ran like wildfire. And I actually just posted it recently because it was the anniversary oh. of it, uh, like five years later. Now, from interviewing people in your meet and greet yeah. at uh, DragCon, one recurring theme that oh. kept coming up was, <laughs> We love Bianca, we love her films, we want a Netflix series. Oh, God. So my question to you would be, if you had unlimited budget and unlimited creative output and you can make a TV series, what would you want it to be? Oh, God, I would love... I mean, on it, listen, and, and the, the craziness, how kind of people to, to want that. Um, I, would, I would love... I mean, I, I remember... I mean, I, it was before my time, but I remember seeing the reruns of The Carol Burnett Show, which was a sketch comedy show that happened uh, in America for many years. And I think it was from 1969 to 1978. It was amazing costumes and amazing stuff. Bob Mackie did all the costumes oh, right. and there was tons of guest stars. That I would do. I don't know if it's possible now financially because it was, <laughs> you know, a full orchestra sets and costumes yeah. each week. But, um, you know, for me, anything, I would love to. Uh, the weird thing is that with the schedule that I've had, um, there really hasn't been that many pockets of time to venture into the television thing. And also, be fair, I haven't had many offers for it because uh, I've been on the road. Um, but the few things that people have said, hey, would you do this? Hey, would you do that? Um, I've never been able to do. Mm. So this next year, I have a little more time and I'm, I'm totally up for it, you know? And the thing with Netflix is that they've, you know, basically taken nobodies and made it into a career. Mm. So I would never, I would never turn it down. Mm. Uh, but there is something I am working on when I go back to Los Angeles that may happen. Yeah, I'm not jinxing it. You heard it here first. I know, yeah, I know. <laughs> So now we're at the part of our interview where I get decent exposure on Miss Bianca Del Rio. This is good, here we go. First question, what is the one item that you couldn't live without? Liquor. 
<laughs> no, uh, liquor eyelash glue, two things that are very hard to find. Because in certain cities, you can't get liquor after certain hours, so to always have a glass of wine is very helpful. Eyelash glue in particular is very important because I can do all of this with charcoal, chalk, and a dream, <laughs> but I definitely need eyelash glue. So those are the two things that I would need, yes. Which talent or skill would you most like to wake up with tomorrow? I'd just be happy to wake up. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, I wish I, I wish I was a better vocalist. I wish I could sing better. Yeah, but I've had a lot of throat trouble because I've had vocal cord surgery and stuff, and I wish I could because I, I marvel at people that are talented vocalists. Yeah. What is your most overused word or phrase? Fuck you, you fucking fuck. It's always <laughs> fuck you, you fucking fuck, and I don't even realize I say because like sometimes when I do stage door for West End, there's people there and there's kids, and I'm just like, oh fuck, and then you see the child, you're like, ah, and they go, the child is your number one fan. I go, that kid's gonna be fucked up <laughs> if they're fake. So fuck is, fuck is definitely it. A job you would like to do besides your own? A hooker. I'd like to, no, I would like to be a hooker. I would like to have the confidence to be a hooker. I've already got somewhat of the look, especially if you're into a clown. But I would say a hooker, because think about it. You get dressed up and people are like, yeah, let's hook up. And you know what I mean? It's, but actually it'd be more practical for me to be a dominatrix because I didn't realize this. I always thought dominatrix have sex. They don't. They just get dressed up and they tell people, fuck you, you're a bad boy. <laughs> that would be ideal for anyway. me. I do it anyway, but now I can charge by the hour. <laughs> Think if I get a whip, bam! You're a bad boy, you're a sad fag, do my laundry. That would be <laughs> ideal. Do you call them hookers here? Hookers, whores. Whores, okay. Yes. Yeah. And what do you, you call them sluts too. Sluts like somebody who doesn't charge. Yeah, or a slag. A slag. A slag. Okay. Oh yes, I've heard that. Yeah, yes. slag. Okay, slag. <laughs> but is slag considered bad or is it just descriptive? Um, descriptive, a bit more endearing, a slag. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so it's like a hooker with a heart of gold. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Like your friends are slags. Or like Nancy and Oliver. She's a slag. She's a slag. Okay, got it. From musical theater faggots, yes. <laughs> Oliver. More, please. Now, what quality do you like most about yourself? The, the ability to adapt. And I think that's important, especially when you are a drag queen. I think it's the ability to adapt. You have to adapt to the environment. You put the wig on, you show up and you go, this is it. Sometimes you have air conditioning. Sometimes there's a mirror. Sometimes there's an audience. <laughs> Just adapt. Sometimes, you know, for me in particular, it was it, especially this year, which was wild. I was doing my show at Carnegie Hall, which was insane. You're in Carnegie Hall. You're in New York City, a place that I lived for many years. It's sold out. You're doing the show. And I couldn't eat, not even 24 hours into this magical experience. The next night I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and there's folding chairs, oh, and there's no air conditioning. <laughs> and I go, that's life, isn't it? One night I'm in Carnegie Hall, glamour, glamour, glamour. The next day I'm in folding chairs. So it keeps you on track. So the trick, the ability is to just, the thing is to just the ability to adapt is very important. Now what quality do you dislike about yourself? Everything. Yeah, I mean, like I can't, um, I can't hear myself and I can't watch myself. You know, and I think a lot of people, uh, especially drag queens, I know like Alyssa Edwards can't get out of a mirror. Uh, she's all about herself and anything yeah. she can want. For me, it's the exact opposite. Like I want to do it, be done with it. I want to live in the moment. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. I can't, like Drag Race in particular, I've watched it when it was airing and I haven't watched it since. Now there's been clips that people show, things that are coming, but I can't sit back because you cringe at it. It's yeah. like, oh, why did I say that? What did I do that? Why did I wear that hair? So yeah, I'm not good with watching or hearing myself. What quality do you like about another the person sense of humor I think it's very important to have a sense of humor as I said before I'm a joke I want people to have a good sense of humor and like I said can't take everything that serious there are things that are important uh, that you take seriously but overall you got to fucking laugh yeah. at it so yeah sense of humor is high on my list I think sense of humor before looks before money before any of that bullshit yeah it's sense of humor yeah what quality just one quality yeah do you dislike about other people <laughs> oh, the fact that they breathe uh, <laughs> No, I think it really depends on the person. Your tolerance level can be weird. I think because I'm a drag queen, a lot of people think that they know me and they think, oh God, I'm scared of this and that. And, and I'm not a scary person in real life. So I feel that, you know, don't be afraid. I think just be yourself, you know, and, and relax. So I, I prefer people to be themselves, but I hate it when people are phony or they put shit, as I sit here in a wig. Uh, <laughs> I hate it when people are phony or not sincere. You know, is that because it's not all this, it's not that difficult. Just be a person. Yeah. yeah. What is your greatest accomplishment so far? Greatest accomplishment is that I get to keep working. I mean, for me, work was a big deal. And I think I consider drag a business mm -hmm. on many levels. Obviously, it's, it's, it's a lot of loveliness as well, but not every day is lovely. And I mm -hmm. think it's important to look at it as a business, not to get wrapped up in ego, not to get wrapped up in vanity. Uh, and you go, I'm lucky to get to work. But you also realize that I have to meet a certain standard. I have to show up. I have to be on time. I have to be professional. So it's not that people are sitting around waiting, oh, we must have Bianca. No, is that they go, all right, well, Bianca showed up. She was good. She worked with, we'll work with her again. And I think that's 
an important factor. What is your greatest fear so far? Um, not having eyelash glue. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would have to say losing my luggage, losing my oh. luggage, and it's happened once. Uh, well, losing it or losing it for a couple of days for a gig, that's just a fuck. It's not so much my biggest fear, it's just a pain in the yeah. fucking ass. Uh, because sometimes you're doing a gig the same day as you travel and it becomes a problem. I don't like much time off in between shows. I like to do show, 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 show. Mm -hmm. um, so when I travel with my tours now, luckily in America and in the UK, I get to travel by bus, so all my shit's with me. Right. But when you don't have it, it's just a pain in the ass. Then you're going to a boots, trying to get your life together oh. in the aisle with baby little lashes. Uh, <laughs> So it's, yeah, losing luggage is a fucking nightmare. Would you rather continue with your life or would you restart it knowing what you know now? I'd continue with my life. I'd continue. I, I don't think going back is going to make anything better. And I, once again, it's like doing drag race. You're like, it's done. It's there. It's put out. I, I wouldn't change any of it. And I think that intelligence is lost on youth uh, or, or youth is lost on intelligence. It's just one of those things where you see people and you're like, you gotta fuck up, you gotta hit rock bottom, you gotta do stupid shit to go, ooh, I shouldn't have done that in order to make it better as yeah. you get older. I don't think if you came out with all the, look at the people that are given all these opportunities when they're young and how they fuck it up. Yeah. So I think it's important to kind of live through life and you go, all right, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have done this, and then you adapt to what's important. What are you most grateful for in life? I think my friends that keep me grounded, I think that's most important because, I mean, despite relationships and, and family members that have kind of come and gone, my friends have always been there. Mm. There's no, ex they don't expect anything from me. And some of them, you know, work for me now, which is great. So I pay them to be nice to me. And they, uh, <laughs> they keep me grounded. They don't let me get excited. They don't let me become a diva. They make me carry my own luggage. Uh, they don't, they don't. They don't think I'm pretty, they don't think I'm smart, they don't think of this, they show up and they go, hmm, that was all right. And that's good. I think that's very helpful, especially in show business. I think that's very helpful. Well, Miss Bianca Del Rio, thank you so much for being on my channel and helping me kick off my Decent Exposure series. I'm excited to see it. So now everybody has to subscribe to this to see the further interviews. Yes. And I spoke with him personally. He's got some good interviews coming up as well. Yes. So this is gonna be good. So you're gonna continue with this series. Yes, everybody has me. to subscribe. Yeah, you have to subscribe. Make yeah. sure you ring the bell icon so you catch the next interview. Um, and so when can we see Bianca on stage again? Australia? Australia. Well, I start up again in Australia. Throughout the summer, I have a lot of one-offs that I'll be doing. We're doing Amsterdam Pride. I'll be doing Tel Aviv. I'll be doing a fashion show that's happening in Florida uh, because I'm trying to get my life settled in <laughs> California. Right. Uh, so I'm doing that in between. And I have to have my tonsils out because my uncle kept saying that my tonsils were tickling his dick. <laughs> so I have to get them taken out. Uh, but yeah, so I have some recovery time I have to deal with and I want to see my dogs. So uh, I will be starting yeah. Australia in September, which they haven't announced yet, but they'll be announcing soon. So uh, yeah, so that's good. And then of course I'll be going around the world once again, yeah. which I'm excited about, but I do get a little downtime to kind of navigate my real life, which is good. Brilliant. So stay tuned, stay Brilliant. tuned. You never know. I mean, you can see me on stage. You could see me in your local bathroom. I could be anywhere. <laughs> I could truly be anywhere. I have no standards. Well, thank you for watching this video. I'm Miss Bianca Delria. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mwah. 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 For now, bye. Bye.